Kip Eidenberg is the Senior Vice President of Government and Industry Relations at the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. And I thought having Kip come on and talk a little bit about what's going on in his industry, but also what's happening more broadly with the economy as we look at small businesses struggling to stay afloat. I thought having Kip come on just just before Joe Biden heads out to Milwaukee would help bring uh, really shed some light on uh, some of the bigger issues that perhaps we haven't been able to focus on given the impeachment of President Donald Trump and of course all of that that goes with it. Kip, thank you so much for joining us uh, this week to discuss really the future of manufacturing and uh, in the economic recovery here on the POTUS 120. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. So, Kip, let's just talk a little bit about your organization, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. Now, this is a pretty broad uh, uh, coalition of companies that not only build uh, agricultural equipment, but also like factory equipment and, uh, and, and, and really big machinery. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what your organization uh, does, who it represents, and, and really how it's been impacted uh, over the past year from the, uh, from the COVID. Yeah, you, you bet, Mark. So, so very briefly, a AEM, or the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, we, we represent the off-road equipment uh, manufacturing industry. That's both the manufacturers and the suppliers. And, you know, put differently, our member companies make the equipment that builds, powers, and, and feeds the world. But, and I think this is important, the, the 2.8 million men and women of our industry, and 187,000 of them, by the way, are in Wisconsin. They're not just welders and fabricators and machinists. You know, they are also parents, their coaches, their mentors, their farmers, and their neighbors. And so when we talk about the policies that are important to those 2.8 million men and women, it's not just the policies that are important to the industry per se, whether that is a infrastructure investment, free and fair trade, or policies that strengthen rural communities, but I think it is about the policies that will help lift up all Americans. And let me tell you, you mentioned that the president it's heading out to, to Milwaukee, which is great, by the way. That is where we're headquartered, so we're glad to have him in our hometown. Let me tell you what is on the mind of those 187,000 men and women in Wisconsin. And that is that President Biden's commitment to make bold investments in American manufacturing, industry, and innovation so that the future is made in America. And if that promise is kept, then we'll be interesting to hear what he has to say about it during his town hall that equipment manufacturers can continue to create more family-sustaining jobs and better equip the U.S. economy to compete in the global economy. And to do that, President Biden will need to work with Democrats and Republicans in Congress to advance not only pro-manufacturing policies, but I think pro-American policies that are needed to strengthen and grow our manufacturing sector. Kip, let's, uh, I, I want to dive a little, uh, a little bit more deeply into some of those things, or at least some of the, uh, the policy proposals that your industry would like to see uh, put in place. But before, before we even get to that, I think you raise a, a very good point here, uh, which is always discussed, but I think at no better time uh, does it really need to be discussed, is now, and that is the ability for bipartisanship to be extended you know, not only from the White House to uh, Capitol Hill, but also from Capitol Hill back to the White House. Now, you've been around Washington for many years, as I have. Uh, I have seen things pretty bad over the years. I've never seen things this bad, though. And I just wonder if it's a, if this is a hurdle that you think that can be overcome. You know, and, and, and speak, I guess, uh, when I ask you this question, not with hope, but, but with reality. Like, what, what, what needs to help overcome this, uh, this partisanship that is just really, really, really sharp on both sides of the aisle? Well, that's a great question, Mark. And I, I think it's really basic in many ways. We, we need to get back to a common sense, solutions-oriented approach to governing. Our elected officials in Washington need to reach across the aisle and work in a bipartisan fashion to advance policies, whether pro-manufacturing or other policies, that will create more family-sustaining jobs for Americans and make sure that we grow the middle class. I mean, this should not be a radical idea, but sadly, these days, it is. And so I think, you know, we all as, as Americans have a, an obligation and a responsibility. And, and again, I'd be interested to hear what some of the folks that participate in the town hall with the president have to say about this. We have to remind our elected officials that enough is enough. You know, that 
cheap campaign promises, slogans, uh, and, and, and issues that are really more about messaging than making real progress cannot be acceptable anymore. We, we cannot tolerate that. We've got to get back to actually working for the American people. And, and I think that there are some opportunities, Mark, you, you talk about policy specifically, there are some opportunities here to advance some policy priorities that I think are truly bipartisan. Um, infrastructure, for example, it's one of those um, that is not just key to our industry, but I think it's key to the long-term success of our country as well. Uh, infrastructure is pretty basic. You know, we, we all need it. We all consume it. We all depend on it. I think you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has made that more clear than ever. And so I think that is a great starting point for Republicans and Democrats and the president to sit down and say, okay, well, how can we make some real progress for Americans? Well, let's start by investing in our infrastructure. That will create more good paying jobs. And I think it will get the economy back up and running again. Kip Eiderberg represents the Association of Equipment and Manufacturers based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where President Biden will be there this coming Tuesday. He'll be doing a CNN town hall taking questions from the audience, which will be interesting. Kip, I, uh, I produced a Biden town hall uh, back in September for CNN as well. We did it outside uh, at a uh, drive-in theater. It was, it was quite a scene. Uh, this time we go inside as cases are starting to drop, and uh, we'll have a socially distanced audience, but it's going to be very, very, very eerie, I think, getting back out there on the campaign trail uh, as we have been pretty much, like everyone else, locked locked down at home. You know, Kip, when, uh, when we talk about specific policy, I'm glad you brought up infrastructure because that's something I, I do want to do a deep dive on because I, cause I do think that that could be the uniting piece of policy that can actually get passed, uh, you, you know, in this very divided Washington right now. Um, and before we even dive a little bit deeper into some of the other things that, that you guys are focused on, uh, how has your members been hit by COVID? How bad has this been? Has there been some kind of inoculation uh, for, for some reason? And when I say that, have they been able to, to dodge the economic bullet a little bit on this? Or, or where, what is the state of, uh, of your member companies right now in this uh, economic times? Well, that's, that's a great question, Mark. And I, I think the, the verdict here is, is uh, it's a bit mixed in, in terms of the impact on, on our industry. Obviously, you know, uh, about a year ago or so when, when the pandemic really started to intensify, you know, it, it hit our industry pretty hard initially. Uh, I think it hit a lot of industries hard. Um, and, and obviously the, the safety and well-being of, of, um, of those 2.8 million men and women of our industry has always been the top priority. And so a lot of, a lot of, uh, of our member companies had to shut down and, and sort of readjust to, uh, you know, operating in, in the COVID-19 pandemic environment. Uh, so that obviously had an impact. Uh, then global supply chains, uh, you know, and, and domestic supply chains for that matter as well, but, you know, they came under intense uh, pressure uh, early on in the pandemic, which obviously had a, a trickle-down effect on our, on our member companies. You know the ability to get parts uh, and components into manufacturing facilities, and then, and then the ability to, to a certain degree, to get finished products out. Uh, that hit us pretty hard, uh, and I think it, it was more more of an impact in some ways on the construction side of our industry than the agriculture side of our industry. You know, farmers still had to be out in the field, you know, to plant and harvest uh, and grow the food that we all depend on. Uh, so we saw the impact a little bit more more harder on the on the construction side. But overall, our industry, you know, it, it, it took a hit, no doubt. But thanks to the uh, to the essential nature of, of manufacturing and and, uh, and the steps that many governors took early on to make sure that our facilities and, and you know, our member companies' facilities were able to to stay open and on the job, you know, the the uh, the recovery was pretty quick as well. And and I don't want to give you the impression that 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 the industry has fully recovered. You know, we have not. I think we've turned a corner uh, since uh, since the height of the pandemic, uh, with certainly the impact. Um, but some of our smaller member companies, uh, and particularly those who provide parts and components to the, to the larger manufacturers, they're still struggling. Uh, and I think it's, it's partly has to do with the fact that the economy is, is still not fully back uh, to where it was um, before the pandemic. 
but also uh, we're still feeling a little bit of an impact from from supply chains uh, you know, and and some of the smaller suppliers' uh, ability to weather the uh, the economic downturn uh, has had a trickle down effect. So uh, you know, I'd say that right now uh, we're probably at least uh, a year or two away from being back to where we were in, in late uh, 2019, early 2019, early 2000. Kip, what are some of the specific policies? I mean, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of an economic outlook that a lot of folks are looking at, saying like, you know, in two years we'll be back. Although I got to tell you, these these variants, these strains that kind of have been the offshoot of the uh, of the original COVID virus, just, just certainly gives me pause that uh, that we're going to be living the rest of our lives in some kind of uh, you know, some kind of protective uh, way, given the mutations that we've seen from COVID. So, so let's say it's about a, a year or two uh, before we do see the the economy come back. What are some specific policies right now? Uh, and uh, and let's hold off on talking about infrastructure because I think that's just a fascinating conversation in and of itself, and we'll tackle that. But what are some of the specific things that you would like to see come out of the Biden administration and supported and championed by uh, by Congress? Are there tax tax things that you'd like to see? Are you concerned that Biden may perhaps roll back some tax cuts? What are what are some of the, you know, some of the things you're looking for, I guess, and, and some of the things that you're concerned may change? Well, I think that's a great question, Mark. And it, it begins, as, as we've talked about, it begins with rebuilding and modernizing our nation's infrastructure. We, we've got to start there. You know, an, an investment in our in infrastructure, you know, it's an investment in our country, and, and it is a jobs program. And I think the only way that we can stay competitive in the 21st century economy, you know, both as an industry and as a country, is if we have a state-of-the-art infrastructure. And this includes, you know, we, 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 it has to be forward-looking, right? So this includes roads and bridges, but roads and bridges that anticipate the emergence of autonomous vehicles, uh, water management systems that protect the watershed and also provide clean water for Americans, transportation systems that provide effective alternatives to the single passenger automobile, so you know, mass transit, a robust electrical grid that enables alternative energy sources to be fully integrated into our economy. We need you know, safe, reliable, and affordable energy to be competitive. And then broadband access for every American. I, I cannot stress enough the importance of reliable high-speed broadband. Okay, I got to stop. I have to stop you there because personally, I, I can tell you personally that I, I have encountered that myself, and 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 I say this as somebody who comes from Washington D.C. and who has everything at his, his fingertips. So like, don't cry me a river, Mark. You know, type of situation. But I have been um, uh, at a place where there is no broadband, and it is very difficult to get a cell phone call out. It is very difficult to um, it's, it's to get any kind of a strong internet, uh, you know, for that matter, uh, other than having to use satellite television or something like that. So I, I do agree with you on on the broadband. It's something that I think everyone has to experience a little bit now, especially those of us who have it, to understand what it means not to have it. I mean, it's almost like after those storms when you can't use your water for, for whatever reason, and then you realize how much you need water or how much you need electricity. Sorry, Kip, I interrupted you there. No, but, but it's a great point, Mark. And, and let, me, let me share with you a, a, a brief anecdote here. And then, you know, the times before the pandemic, you know, I used to travel around the country, you know, visiting with all of our member companies, uh, you know, and, and they, you know, they're located, you know, anywhere from Georgia to Washington State, you know, Texas, to Massachusetts, and so I we have a member company in, in Perry, Oklahoma, and one of the folks that worked there told me a story about how his wife, and they live about an hour and a half west of Perry, Oklahoma, she has to drive to the uh, manufacturing facility, the plant, twice a week so that she can access reliable high-speed internet so that they can pay their bills, so that they can do some shopping, uh, they can download, you know, educational resources for their children. And this is absolutely insane. There is no other way of putting that. The fact that we have Americans in our country who have to drive an hour and a half just so that they can connect to the Internet, you know, that is a big reason why, you know, we are not as competitive as, as we should be. I mean, the fact that millions of Americans do not have access to reliable high-speed broadband, um, 
it, it means that we're leaving too many hardworking Americans at a disadvantage, well, given the modern importance of connectivity. You and I know it, right? Well, well, I mean, I mean, and well, access well, to high speed internet, and we're we're seeing it with our kids now, right? With kids that are not able to right. have high speed uh, uh, internet. Let alone have computers, but I mean, I mean, assuming that they'd have that, but they can't get high-speed internet uh, in order to continue learning uh, at times when schools have to go virtual because of uh, whatever spike in COVID cases. So, yeah, it, it really is something. I, I mean, I have to say, as, as and I will say, as the arrogant East Coast uh, person, I wouldn't say I'm elite, but person you know that I am, is that uh, I, I never really truly understood the broadband argument. I mean, I supported it, but it was nothing other than than any other thing that other that people were advocating for here in Washington D.C. But when you when you when you experience it, especially after how people right now have become so accustomed to everything being so immediate and at your fingertips, uh, and when you realize that it's not there, it is uh, it is really game changing. And to your point, I mean, how do you stay competitive if you're slow? Right. No, you can't. And I think if, if anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has reinforced the importance of investing in, in, in uh, high-speed broadband, uh, you know, whether it's you know, the parents struggling to, uh, to teach their children or the veterans in rural areas that cannot you know, access critical telehealth services. We, we absolutely have to make a long-term significant investment in, in our infrastructure, but in, in high-speed broadband in, in particular. Um, but, but I think in, in, you know, beyond, and you, you asked about what are those, what are those pro manufacturing policies that are going to make a difference for our industry? Infrastructure obviously is one of them. And again, we think it, it really needs to start with infrastructure. We see it as a job still. We see it as a long term investment in our country. But beyond that, Mark, the other thing that's really important to, to our industry, and again, many of those 187,000 men and women who build equipment in the state of Wisconsin is trade. 30% of all equipment made in this country is destined for export. And the, the only way that we can sell more equipment is if we create more markets for it. And and that means that we've got to we got to get back to trading with our friends and partners around the globe. And we've got to prioritize policies that, that make trade you know possible. Now, Kip, I, uh, I, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens on, on the trade argument, you know, given the uh, not only the struggles, I guess, between the two parties, but the in internal struggles that uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are dealing with right now. You know, I think uh, I was going to say let's jump right into infrastructure, but I think we've already jumped right into infrastructure. You know, I think it is one of those, uh, it is one of those policies, Kip, that uh, I think we will – We'll see potentially get done. I mean, I, I I think there's going to be some kind of appetite for something to get done, um, and I think that very well may be it. I don't know what is the uh, what are the odds right now. I know there are a lot of people. There, there's so much money at stake in a new infrastructure bill that would for our listeners, as we're talking, which would basically pay for for the whole electrical grid and not the whole, but it would pay for upgrades to to your water and and your sewer lines and your bridges and your electrical grid. I mean everything that we take for granted. Uh, and there's an incredible amount of money that's going to be attached to that. And Kip, what is the uh, what are the betting odds that this gets done this week when you're talking? Talking amongst other stakeholders about it. Well, we are we are cautiously optimistic, maybe, maybe more so than we've we've ever been, right? And and this is where the uh, where the where the, uh, the infrastructure we jokes come in, right? We've we've heard this over and over and over again. Uh, President Trump talked about it. He was going to make it a priority in his you know first hundred days or his first year in office. Uh, you know, before him, uh, President Obama and President Bush talked a lot about it. You know, they, they made some attempts at, at making a, a significant long-term investment in our infrastructure. It never really materialized. Um, but, but more so now than ever, we are hearing from both Democrats and Republicans that, that they really do want to actually move forward with this. And I, I think, you know, I don't want to oversimplify this, Mark, but, but we can no longer be focused on just how to pay for it. I mean, that is usually where it breaks down up on Capitol Hill. You know, Democrats have one idea, Republicans have another, and, and you know, the, the end result is that we end up doing nothing. Uh, but I think perhaps the, the, the pandemic, you know, the, the realization that, that we need our infrastructure uh, and we need it to work, um, you know, and, and then the fact that we've got to do something about getting the, the economy back up and running again, we've got to put Americans back to work. I think maybe that has focused the minds a little bit more uh, of, of, of lawmakers than it has in the past. And so we're seeing a real 
interest in moving forward. There's still going to be debate about how to pay for it. Some will say we should increase the gas tax. You know, that hasn't been done since 1993. Uh, some say it, it should be more private money than, than public money. You know, others are talking about a, a VMP, vehicle miles traveled type of user fee. Some are saying, hey, money is cheap right now. Let's just deficit fund it. But, but they are actually talking about how to pay for it rather than making up excuses for why they cannot pay for it. So I think we will see something happen. And whether it's part of, you know, the initial, um, you know, stimulus bill that they're still working on, the relief bill, uh, whether it's also part of, of the recovery bill that we expect to follow in the next couple of months. And, and it will probably be a little bit in the first and a little bit more in the second. But, but I actually think it's going to happen this time around. And, and we've been making the case over and over again that, you know, infrastructure is probably the most bipartisan issue there is, you know. We joke about potholes not being Democratic potholes, Republican potholes. They're just potholes, and they're everywhere. And I think that that's finally maybe dawning on, on lawmakers that they have an opportunity. And I think also, and we, we talked about this early on, I think there's more pressure right now on them all to get something done. I think Americans are just fed up with gridlock. You know, they're fed up with gridlock on our roads. They're fed up with gridlock in Congress. So I think, I think lawmakers are committed to, to making it happen. And we'll, we'll just have to see how big of an investment they make. I certainly hope that it's a significant one. But at this point, any investment is, is a good investment. Kip, we'll have to leave it there. If you want to learn more about the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, you can go to their website, aem.org. And Kip, uh, are you a social media type of fellow? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can follow um, on Twitter at AEM Advisor. Uh, there's a lot of great news and updates about what's going on in the world of manufacturing. Terrific. Well, hey, thanks so much for joining us, uh, Kip, this week on Full Stop. It was uh, an interesting conversation. 